All right. Welcome. We are in breakout room three, where we'll be discuss discussing self-grading checks for understanding. Um, let's see. All right. So this strategy, our goal is just to talk about how we can create and use mini formative assessments to inform teachers on student mastery of learning objectives. Keep in mind that checks for understanding are not meant to be big end of unit assessments, not even like the weekly quizzes that you might be given. These are meant to be quick um, assessments that you can use to make mid-course corrections so that your students can be learning the material that you want them to learn so that if needed your instruction can be changed or adjusted and whatever gaps there are can be in addressed. Um, using self-grading checks for understanding allows you to provide targeted and actionable feedback that way students also know um, whether they are learning as they need to be learning or if they need to make adjustments themselves. There's a link here that you're welcome to check out with a little bit more information about checks for understanding. Um, we won't go through it, but it is a great article just talking about the idea of checks for understanding. Okay, so next up, we're going to watch uh, just about two minutes of this video that goes through the importance of checks for understanding and how we use them for data. So we're going to watch just about two minutes of this. As we've said throughout this course, formative assessment is for learning. Therefore, you have to use the data to design and redesign pathways and strategies for all students to reach their learning goals. Data should be reviewed often and decisions made quickly. Remember that decisions do not necessarily have to be made for the entire class. You may make student-specific decisions based on the data as well. The goal is to personalize and differentiate instruction as needed for each student. If you obtain data in the middle of a class, you do not need to wait until the next class period to make adjustments. Adapt right then and there if necessary. The value of many of the quick formative assessment strategies, such as the thumbs up, thumbs down, fist to five, one sentence summary, questioning, discussion, and many others is that they can be used during the learning process so you can make adjustments on the fly. There never seems to be enough instructional time, so why wait until the end of the class period to find out whether you need to make adjustments in your lesson plan for the next class? Just as many things in life can be ignored, so can data. It's a fact that we don't always like the data that we obtain, and sometimes there isn't enough data, but ignoring it isn't going to make things any better. According to Charles Babbage, the person who originated the concept of the programmable computer, errors using inadequate data are much less than those using no data at all. Data is often imperfect and incomplete, but don't let that push you to fly blind. Move forward with the data that you do have and make it a goal to improve data collection over time. Don't ignore data. Do something about it. We've covered a lot in this course. Okay, so uh, just to kind of review that uh, information there. What we're trying to do with the checks for understanding is that you have real time data that then you can use to make instructional decisions in your classroom. So again, thinking back to our responsibility of uh, ensuring that we're here for the academic and social emotional needs of all of our students. We can't do that without data. Like we need to know where our students are and be able to respond in real time to the information that we're getting from them. Um, the easiest way to do this is with self-grading checks for understanding. So that's gonna be what we're talking about in this session specifically, is being able to gather this data during class and have something else grade it. So that's oftentimes just the, uh, the program or the platform grading it so that then you have the data. What this looked like in my class is that in a typical 50, 55 minute period, about halfway through, I would give my CF view and then do an exit ticket at the end. So my exit ticket was more like uh, formal data on what we learned in the class, but my check for understanding in the middle really helped me do a check-in with my students about, you know, 
hey, 20, 25 minutes in, sometimes 30 minutes in, where are my students at? Or am I going too fast for them? Do I need to slow it down? Is there something I need to reteach? And by having that data in real time in a really easy to read uh, platform, I'm able to make those decisions um, and, and do it in a way that I'm not able to do if, say, I passed out uh, paper and had everybody fill out uh, some answers on a worksheet. I can't respond to all of that data in real time because I can't grade it during the class. But what we're going to be talking about in here is actually gathering that data and then being able to respond to it basically instantaneously, things that we didn't do when uh, when I started my career uh, 14 years ago. We definitely couldn't do the things that we can do today. So again, how does this connect uh, back is that we're responsible for every every piece of data that our students have, and we're responsible for their social, emotional, and academic growth. So by gathering this, then we can address the gaps that we have in our classrooms. We can then adjust our instruction as we're going along with it. So we'll be looking at, at three different tools today that give us that real-time feedback and then be able to go through that. So as we're talking about these tools, we're gonna to talk about then how you can use them in your classroom to actually make shifts that can uh, make a more culturally responsive classroom in your, in your room that's responsive to your students. Listen. Sorry about that. So for this session, we have two options in terms of how you can complete. You can work independently and work through the tools yourself, or you can follow along with us. If you feel like you're familiar with Schoology Assessments, Google Forms, and Kahoot, and you are ready to create your own self-grading check for understanding that you can use in your classroom, you are welcome to use this time to do that. So we will return to this to the main room at 11 o'clock. So you have from now until 11 o'clock to either independently work through the resources that we have and then create your own check for understanding or you can stay on here with us and we'll talk through how to use these tools, some of the features maybe that you may not know about specifically within Schoology assessments um, and just kind of talk through how you can set one up um, and use it to inform your instruction. Either way, our goal is for you to also be able to create your own um, check for understanding that you can then use. So we'll work on that. And again, at 11 o'clock, we will meet back in the main room. Okay, so first up then that we're gonna talk about is Schoology Assessments. So Schoology Assessments is a tool within Schoology that allows us to quickly give auto-graded activities for our students. And you can see which ones are auto-graded, which is the majority of them, and which ones need a teacher grade. So um, like a short answer or an essay would obviously need a teacher to do that. Um, and so uh, the rest are all ones that uh, we can use. So it's pretty easy to do like a, a true false or a matching or a multiple choice. And a lot of teachers are pretty familiar with those in assessments. But we're going to highlight today are uh, three tools that are a little bit more advanced and aren't as intuitive to create, but are really great because they are not just like ones that students can guess at very easy and uh, keeps your assessments a, in a variety of different modes so that you can really know what it is. So if you have like a four, four question multiple choice, that's not bad for a CFU. And we're going to do a game later that'll have some of that. But just the information is not as valid because students can still guess 25% of the time and get it right. Um, but like labeling an image, it's much harder to guess at that. Um, so it gives us really great data. And then it just switches it up on the students that they're not just doing a whole bunch of multiple choice all day long for it. So we're going to cover these three, but also there's other ones here. So if you have any questions, um, we'll have some time uh, at the end of, of this little section on school G assessments to go through any of those. So here is my sandbox. And when I'm adding an assessment, I'm going to come here to my um, my add materials. The old way of doing assessments was this what they called test quiz. And that came out um, a bunch of years ago. Um, and it's their kind of legacy way of giving an assessment to students. It's good. And it's really good for like multiple choice and stuff. But 
I always recommend assessments just because it's so much more robust, has about four times as many question types, a lot more customization that you would have um, with it. So I always recommend assessments and not to really even use test quiz um, because assessments just such a better platform. So we're going to go to assessments then. So I'm just going to type in some information here, give it a due date. Okay, I can have submissions disabled or enabled here. So this is um, if I want it live now, so like my students can do it right now, or if I want it enabled in the future, I can do from tell until, and so I can turn it on for like a specific part of my class or disable it. Um, I can give a password for it, and then my regular standard uh, grading categories and stuff here. Then when I come in, it's gonna open up my settings right away my setup and uh most of this is pretty standard that you have here like you can put a time limit on there you can randomly order questions so that uh, students aren't doing the same question for everybody having the same question one so that's a good one that i like to have on but i always recommend these two features right here in assessment toolbar so they are the top two so i'm going to turn both of these on always and that is students can flag questions for review so it's going to have a little flag at the top of the question and if they want to come back to it later on say like that's a really tough one or i don't know i'm going to leave it blank for right now but they flag it so they don't just leave it blank always this is something that they can do in pretty much all assessment platforms but really it's in cms so it's good cms practices to have that flag for review another cmas practice that's just good and it's just good test taking skills too even if you don't care about cmas at all is that uh, students can eliminate answer choices so this is for like true false uh, multiple choice that they can come through and they can put like a big red x over one of the answers so if you have like a four question multiple choice and they say oh i know it's not b but i don't know which are the other ones they can cross out b and now they have a 33 percent chance instead of a 25 percent chance of getting that um, so those are two things that i always recommend to turning in an assessment they're just good test taking you also can have like a notepad or highlighting of the text which are good um, you can do like a calculator if you're a math or a ruler as well um, and then i'm going to go ahead and hit say that then it actually comes time to do my questions so we have like the true false matching all that stuff here ordering pretty simple easy to do what we're going to do today then is a drag and drop um, fill in the blank because fill in the blank is great but it's not super intuitive how to create it so i'm going to just type into my box here a question or a phrase and then i'll have a blanks and then when I want to do a blank, I'm just going to do a simple one underscore. So when we've made assessments in the past, right, you have like multiple underscores that you would have, you know, so that they have space to write in. This one here, the code is just that you write in one little thing there. And then you're going to have your options. So I'm going to have fill in the brother, fill in the. So I have my different options here. I can have as many as I want. And then I just need to tell the computer what is my correct answer. So that's going to be dragging this one in here. I can have multiple uh, ones in here. So let's me here. Right, and I can have response two. And I can have this here. The more fill in the blanks you have, the less easy it is for students to guess at it. So the more options that you have. And this is a great accommodation for students that have um, special needs. So like uh, 504 students or IEP students or language learners that you might give um, uh, a fill in the blank where they don't have answer choices to uh, students that don't need extra supports. And this could be an accommodation that you give to students that have it is that they have an item bank to go along with it. So that's a different version that you can make for your students. So I'll save that one. Then also a fun one here is a label and image. So I have an image and being a former social studies teacher i'll just say that i have a blank us map 
could be could be better. Right? And then I can go like. Yeah. Any, any hey, make it pretty easy. Let's label Colorado here, and then I can have uh, some different options. So here would be actually Colorado. Here would be one, right? Maybe put Texas something i can do really whatever i want on here i can use this for science with diagrams i can have it for uh, literacy with um, a book cover on it that you can dissect it you can do different things with it here and then with this label here i would then say adding in my options and i would add in my options as i go along in here and then just coming down i would say which one is the actual correct Colorado here for it. Um, so I can just put it anywhere on the map or on any image that I have here. Um, I've seen math teachers do this with different formulas that they have on there and students need to fill in the different pieces of it. Um, and they can go ahead uh, and do that. So again, a different type of assessment. Um, until you kind of see that one, it's a little hard to understand how it works, um, but is a really cool one. And students appreciate having something that's not multiple choice uh, and have an image to look at as well. Then the next one is gonna be highlight a text. And highlight text is really cool because we do so much with text across all of our content areas. So social studies, science, literacy, math, we have text that we want our students to be using. So I have, a little passage here from, uh, I believe it's a ninth grade text, uh, the other West Moore. So I'm going to uh, drop in here, I'll say, right, so something that we're talking about is the main idea. So I drop in the text here. I just found a digital version of the other Westmore and I put it in here. And then I'm gonna come over here to my possible responses. And in possible responses here, I can do this automatically and have it select a paragraph or a sentence or a word. So if I have like a sentence and I want them to pick out the noun or I want them to pick out uh, the word that that expresses the feelings of the author or, or something like that. I just will have them pick out the individual word and that'll dissect it all, or I can have it by sentence. But with this passage, I've actually figured out that the sentence doesn't really work that well. So I'm just gonna do it manually. So I'm just gonna highlight the sentences on my own here. And then it puts a little box around it that, that makes it the answer that is available. So I'm just gonna go through here. pretty quick and I have my different possible. And again, like always, it's gonna say, what's the correct one here? Uh, what sentence does it? Um, so then I'm gonna say that this is the correct sentence that supports the main idea of the chapter. Again, the top here is not one of my sentence options. I just chose the sentences in this passage. And this is really robust. You can do a lot of different things with passages through this as well. Um, so I can save that out and then my students have that. Again, uh, just so many options with text that we have. Do you all have any questions about any of the other ones that you see here on the left or on the slide um, after I covered three of them? I'm glad you like it, Don, thank you. I find this menu on the left-hand side a little daunting. Like it starts with some of the easier ones and then it gets more complicated. And teachers that I've worked with oftentimes don't get past like maybe the first third or the first half. Um, so that's why I wanted to kind of show some of these other ones here. Okay, so again, uh, you can create like three questions here for it in the middle of a lesson. It's gonna auto grade. There is a little bit of a delay with getting your results, but when I actually do have my results, I can come back to my feedback. So I'm gonna show you uh, an example that I've done with my team and I'll show you what it looks like when I have my grading. So I've pulled it up that my students have done it. You can see my students that are absent or haven't done it. 
this one has a question type that needs grading, so I need to go back to that. But otherwise, I can come in here and I can see, hey, Steve got it. He got almost a 90%. He did really good. Uh, so some more needs grading. Lispin here got an 81%. So go Lispin. You got to be on it. And I can come through and say, again, who's missing it or who's still in progress? Like I know as a teacher, you have those students who do the work, but they just don't hit that submit button or they don't do that last question. And actually Amy here has done it twice and not got it submitted. So I need to follow up with her individually on that. So I can be doing this, I can be watching it actually as the students are coming in and dropping in their answers and I can get that real time feedback from them. Um, so it's a really great way to do that check for understanding just within the platform. And then it gives them an easy grade uh, in the grade book as well because it'll auto grade that into there. Yeah, what, what are they doing while I'm checking the responses? So I'm watching it in real time. So as they're coming in and I'm moving around the room as they're doing it. And I always have options for my students, like when they're done with something that they are doing different things in my classroom. So I have like different stations set up or I always have like a little board at the front of like, what should I be doing? And I have listed out like organizing your notes or uh, reviewing work from the past or reading the chapter and I have the chapter on there. So I have different things for them to always be doing if they are one of those that finish it really quickly. But I'll say, since this is a quick check for understanding, everybody should do it within like three or four minutes and then we're moving on. Uh, that I'm gonna be reviewing it. Um, no, I, I would do it pretty much every day just because it's it's really quick. Again, like three or four minutes because three or four minutes of a 50 or 55 minute period is a really like a, a good hunk, but I want that feedback from it. Um, and then I can do like a reteach, say that I know that uh, question two was a really hard one. Are they? Here, let's go to reporting. Um, I can come in here and I can look at my students that's not bringing all of it, but I can look at my individual questions and uh, know what I want to do a reteach or follow up with the students that need it. Maybe then I use this to pull my groups for the day. Um, there's a lot of different things, but I, I want it quick uh, and then give uh, quick feedback and changes to my instructions. Um, so this is really designed to, to be in the middle of a lesson. You can use it for a traditional exit ticket, and exit tickets are great. Um, I think that exit tickets are something that a lot of DPS teachers have really mastered, and you can use this for exit tickets as well, so that then you have that data that you can look at at the end of the day from your classes. Um, but what we're really talking about in this breakout is uh, like in in time, like real time feedback from uh, your students while you're doing a lesson. Good questions. I appreciate all of the interactivity after coming out of a break. I feel like I have like an after break fog going on, so appreciate it. Okay, so then we're gonna have a little bit of fun here. Oh, I actually need to update my Kahoot link. So sorry, give me just one minute. And while you're doing that, I'll answer the question that just came yeah, in. In terms, in terms of attempts, um, it, if this is going to be a quick check for understanding, then you probably don't need to give too many. I would probably just do one because really I just need to know, do they get it or do they not? And we can break this down by question. So it's not something that I'm like spending a ton of time digging into each one. Like I'm going to look at, you know, the breakdown by question and see, oh, it looks like number four was the one they didn't get. That's the one I'm going to review right now. We'll talk about it, reteach however you want to. If you want to use it, you know, as a teaching tool and allow them retakes, absolutely. That can also be a great part of um, a quick check for understanding. But you know, it's up to you as to as to what you're trying to accomplish with it. Um, but if it is just a quick check for understanding, I'd probably stick to one. You can use this without going into the gradebook. This can be an ungraded assignment um, so that it's not something that counts against them, or um, and which makes sense, especially if it is kind of a mid-course check. It's not something um, that you're wanting to necessarily grade them on, you can make it an ungraded assignment. The notepad, are you, I'm trying to, there's a notepad in settings. Um, yeah, that so that, that gives just a little uh, 
tool at the top of their that'll pull up a little notepad like on top of their screen so if they want to like you know do some math or something it just pulls that up oftentimes a lot of students will just open up a google doc though to write in some notes but it is an option that you can have turned on that's mostly for math i would say Okay, so next up, we're going to do a Kahoot, and our Kahoot is actually, uh, we're, we're going to just play it. So if you've played a Kahoot, this is just for fun review. Um, if you haven't done a Kahoot before, then um, then uh, this will be a, a hands-on practice, I guess I would say, of how to do this. Um, so we just have six questions about digital citizenship. We can see how great you are. You can go to kahoot.it and enter in the game pin there. Um, you can use phones in the class if students do that, but all of our students have devices, so that shouldn't be a hard thing to do. You can just grab the link before class begins, drop it into your Schoology course and get going. Or if you're doing like a remote class or something, you can just drop it in the chat like I have here. All right. So uh, just before we begin, Kahoot's a really simple um, check for understanding platform. It's mostly multiple choice, like true, false kinds of things. There are some different question types you can do, and some of them are free, uh, are premium. But this is something that gets students really excited to do their learning. Um, <laughs> I see Don shaking her head, right? Like sometimes when I'm coaching teachers, I'll, I'll say like, just be prepared. The students might get a little bit rowdy on this. You might want to like give them some like a uh, like pre-discussion of like what's going to happen and how they should act. So that, you know, don't jump up and down when you take first place and stuff like that. Um, it's amazing that seniors or like sixth graders or like ninth graders, even you know Riley, Wiley uh, freshmen, get really excited to play such a simple game. But it is fun. So let's go ahead and jump into it. You do get more points the faster you are. But if you get something wrong, you don't get the points at all. So be uh, fast but accurate. Here we go. When you create passwords, you should make them simple so you don't forget. So I have it set for 20 seconds to respond, but if, if everybody responds, it'll automatically end the question here. We're waiting on one last person to give a response. And here we go. So we had three people get it right, right away. One that didn't respond and one that got a false. So this is, actually a fairly good response. You guys did a pretty good job. So I'm just gonna move on to the next question because uh, I checked for understanding and we have pretty good understanding. Then our scores. Oh, uh, Dawn was the quick fingers on that one. She knew what it was. Next question. The most popular sites are usually safe from hackers and their traps. All right, went really fast on that one, and we have false. Again, you guys are right on top of it this morning. Dawn is still in first place. We'll see if anybody can unseat her. Malware is a common term used to describe a worm, advertisement software, a virus, or a uh, dangerous program. Oh, 100%. So I'm loving this as a teacher, as I'm doing a check for understanding, because you guys are right on top of it, even though I haven't pre-taught any of this stuff yet, um, that this allows me to go really quick and know that I can move on to the rest of my content for the day on this. Oh, Don has a hot streak going on. Actually, we have three people that are all doing a great job on this. What is the most responsible way to use social media? This one you have to read a little bit.
all of the you guys are like straight fire this morning oh my gosh listen our our group this morning or uh, not our eight o'clock group did not get this many correct this yeah, would this make me really better. proud as as a <laughs> teacher look at all the points going in love it the photos you post on social media can jeopardize your reputation in the future Let's go. All right. On top of it, this is a really close game because you guys are all getting them right. And last question we'll see here. Stealing someone's words or images from the internet without permission is a crime. Super fast. Moving along. Now, this is the part that all the students go crazy for. Even though it's only taken me, what, three minutes to do this so far, then the students get into this. They love it. I know that my students have done a great job. So third place, second place, and our perfect responses and really fast goes to Dawn. Good job. So then as a teacher, here's where I would give out something special. Uh, like a bathroom pass, a homework pass, or like a fruit snack or something like that, right? Like I always kept a box of fruit snacks because they're like allergy free um, to my top three or to the top one um, and have it there. So super easy to do with students and really energizing. I saw smiles on you guys' faces here already. So like we're about halfway through our, our lesson here this morning and even though it's a check for understanding, like the students get really energized about it and it's a, a switch from what they're doing typically in a class. And it doesn't feel like a check for understanding really. But I got tons of information based off of the answers and as I was being graded in real time. So I can't have this as like a graded assignment in Schoology um, per se without importing those grades over. Um, but it's a really great check for understanding that I can do really quickly and gets the students going. I will say that if you do cahoots fairly regularly, the students will get a little bored with them. So you might want to like use it for a couple of months, not use it for a couple of months, then go back to using it. I have a social studies teacher I've been working with for a while at a middle school who just loves cahoots, but she only uses them for about two months at a time. And then uh, we'll wait a couple of months and then come back from break and use them again. And the students get really energized. But if you do it all the time, it's it's not that uh, that much. So you can kind of switch up what checks for understanding you're doing. Then I really love um, the feedback here. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my feedback. Okay, and then I'm gonna view the full report. So I'm gonna open this up and I'm gonna show you what this looks like in here. So as I have the data, again, this is not gonna go into my Schoology gradebook, but I do have a lot of information here. So I can see that a couple people didn't finish a couple of the questions. So that can give me some follow-up here. I can look at my individual players and I can see then here, oh, Lisbon, you need a little bit of help here. You only got 50% on here. Uh, so I can look at individual responses. This is not something that the students are going to get um, on their end, but I can pull up as a teacher. And then I can even look by question, which was the ones. So none of this data is really bothersome to me. Maybe I would want to cover the content in one and two again, um, but it gives me some really quick uh, feedback from my students right away. Um, Kahoot is a staple of just uh, the tech world, it's been around for a long time and they've acquired other companies. And it's a, a simple thing, but it's it's really easy to use with your students. So do you guys have any questions? Oh, sorry, and I do wanna show you all too. From the teacher side in my account here, if you go to Discover, there are so many lessons in here. So like they have all of these NASA 
uh, activities built in. So all of these games that are actually made by like official NASA. So even if you're not doing like a space unit, but say you're a science teacher or you just want the students to be intrigued, you can do this as like a, a warm welcome, like a warm up activity, or you can have it as a fun game at the end of the class. Hey, if we get all of our work done, we'll take the last five minutes to take a NASA Kahoot. Um, it's crazy good motivation and it's still academic, but it might not be necessarily your exact content. And you can come in here. Anything else that you want to do too, in our morning session, we had a teacher who does audio uh, classes and he just typed in uh, some, um, some different keywords that he wanted to see. And he was amazed by how many lessons or how many quizzes were already pre-built. And say uh, you like some of the questions, but not all the questions, you can delete it. You can change the wording of it. You have full editing rights whenever you grab one of these and add it to your library. So it's a great starting point. Um, so you can see uh, the, um, the, uh, the activity that's already been made, and then you can go in and edit it. I'm not saying it's always like super on grade level or anything like that, so you can make the modifications. And the question in the chat here, um, for the Schoology assessments, it's when you open it up then as a teacher, it has the grading tab at the top, and then that's where you can see all the students, and then you can see the data or the results, I think is what it's called, and then you can see all of that as well. So if you open up the assessment, again, after students have had a chance to take it, you'll see those tabs populated in there. Actually, let me just switch over to that real quick. So we have the uh, grading tab here and the reporting tab. And I only had two people actually submit it. So it doesn't give me the most amount of data right there, but the grading does give me all of my individual results here. What about oh. by question? Oh, sorry, here it is by question. So when I just switch it here to by question, it'll show me. So you can see which ones I did the best and which ones my students struggled with. So like this number line was a little hard for them. So that's something I'd want to address. Or maybe they just had a hard time doing number line because we haven't done that before in, in class. And then you can see my top two ones there are manual grades. So I need to go in and do those individually. Okay. Any other questions about Kahoot or assessments? Just keep going. Yeah, so good question, Hazusa. Do you need to pay for it? Um, all of that data was from the free version. Um, I've used the free version for years. I've done this with like big groups of students, so like 100 kids in a freshman academy, and it allows me to do it. Um, the, the paid version does have some really cool features, but I've never run into a thing where I'm like, oh, I'm really missing out on that. I need to pay for this. Um, and that's why we don't have a district license for it or um, schools don't really buy it. Um, it's great if you do want to, Don. I'm I'm excited that you use it. Uh, I've just always used the free version um, for it. Don, it sounds like you're a pro at this. It, it's just like a, a staple activity for the kids. And I, I don't know what it is about Kahoot because it's so simple, but they get so excited about it. So. All right, so we're going to switch back to our presentation here. And you guys can hear from Lisbon and I can stop talking. <laughs> All right, so our last tool that we'll talk about is Google Forms assessments. So Google Forms also is a really great tool for doing quick checks for understanding. You have a lot of different question types that you can use um, with Google Forms and the reports that you get are also quick, easy to read, a, a great way to kind of decide, you know, what do my students know and what do I need to reteach? Um, Google Forms are great. I will say though, if I, if I had to pick, I would go with Schoology assessments over Google Forms. Um, there's a lot more question types available. And just because it is the LMS that we're using, you know, just being able to have those grades 
right away. Um, I, I do think that the Schoology assessments um, would be my preferred choice. There is, however, one advantage to using Google Forms, and that is that you can use something called lockdown mode. So with Google Forms, in order to use it as an assessment, the first thing you need to do is to go into settings and change it to be a quiz. So then it, it it's actually can be graded, you can select correct choices and all of that. So you're going to make it a quiz. And then one of the options under the settings is to use the locked mode. This will prevent students from opening up other tabs other browsers so that you know you, you they're they're staying only on the quiz so it is a nice feature to have if it is an assessment that you need them to just you know be on that assessment only um, that we don't have available in Schoology um, another, a few other settings that you will want to make sure you set if you are using Google Forms is um, the missed questions, the correct answers, and the point values. If it's a self-grading check for understanding, you want students to be able to know what they're getting right and wrong. You want them to be able to know what the correct answers are so that they can also, you know, it's providing feedback to them as well as yourself as the teacher um, in terms of what they know and what they don't know. And then another helpful setting is um, to require the questions. So when you create the quizzes, you can make it so that they have to answer each question and they're not skipping anything. So if you slide on the required option, um, then it does make it so that they are required to do that. Um, so those are kind of the settings for Google Forms. And then if we go to the next page, we can kind of see the, the grading. Um, when you're when they're done with it, it does create a report for you. You just go up at the top to responses. You can see how many people responded, um, get a summary of those responses. You can see by question, you can see by individual, um, and it gives you a nice graph of how they did. So it makes it easy to kind of decide, oh, question number three, it looks like a lot of them had a hard time on, I need to reteach that. Um, you can also export it as an Excel sheet if you want um, to view the data that way. So there are a lot of great ways to, to see the data and, and make quick decisions based off of it with a, a Google form. Um, another nice um, feature in it is that you can add question feedback or answer feedback. So when students are responding, um, if they get something wrong, you can guide them towards the correct answer or help them understand why it's wrong. Again, making it quick, um, feed, quick um, checks that they can learn from and you can also um, make decisions off of. Any questions on Google Forms? I'll, I'll just highlight here too, because I know that we have some language uh, teachers here this morning, is that the lockdown browser is pretty nice for um, foreign languages because students like to uh, use translator tools. Um, so this is a preferred tool by language teachers. Um, even though it's it's not the greatest, like with the grading and stuff, with getting it into your school grade gradebook, it is a good option to have. Okay, well, thanks for joining us in this breakout room. Um, we have about 13 minutes until um, we're going back to the main room. I'll drop that link back in here um, for us to go back to at uh, 11 o'clock. Um, so you can take the next 13 minutes to um, take a little brain break or work on some of these, play around with any things. Uh, Lisbon and I will be in here um, if you have any questions. Thank you. Hey, I have a question on the uh, Google Forms. I like it, but I found it hard, like when you're trying, you know how like Schoology and then you can be able, like you clicked on that question and it has the question, you have all the kids' answers right there. Is Schoology, not Schoology, is Google Forms where it's only in that a form where I have to create that spreadsheet and then I just kind of have to, is it an easier way to be able to pull that information together? So there's a, a little thing here, and I'll go to the slide deck. If you go uh, by individual, you can see it, or by question for the responses, so that you can see that disaggregated data um, on there. So kind of like we saw in Kahoot and we saw in, um, in Schoology. OK, I'll play with it a little bit more. Thank you. Yep. 
And uh, Don, to your question then is, uh, Schoology has the lockdown option. You just have to pay for it. And as a district, it's going to cost us more money. So we, we, we don't pay for it. I think it would be a cool tool to have, but I also understand budgets. So. So when you're doing your check for understandings, would you be consistent in using the same tool so that the, or would you mix it up a little bit? Do you think it confuses the kids to mix it up too much? Or do you think it's good to just keep it consistent so that they know? I would say it depends on your students. Um, it, it is good to have consistency, but then, you know, as Luke was saying with the Kahoot, they can also get bored with it. So if you do a Kahoot every single day, then, you know, that, that excitement kind of wears off. So switching it around a little bit does help. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do a different tool every single day because um, like you said, consistency also is, is helpful and it's nice to just, you know, keep it simple, especially for something like this. Um, if it's something that you just want for quick information, you don't necessarily need to be doing anything great or different all the time, but it doesn't hurt to, to switch it up a little bit every once in a while. And so with the math, then would I like, um, is there a math tool inside of, I know there's one in this, well, I kind of struggle with Schoology sometimes with it, but mm -hmm. maybe you can tell me some shortcuts with the math, but I did a lot of the, sim some of the symbols are there, some of them are not there, but I've been kind of like cut and paste and putting pictures inside okay. of it. Uh -huh. um, is that pretty much the easiest and best way to do it with the math stuff? So there is that math toolbar. Is there, which symbols are you looking for that you're not finding in there? Um, most like when we were doing inequalities, I think was one of our bigger ones. Mm -hmm. And then um, the um, I'm doing um, financial algebra. So it had like a lot of stuff. So it's like the future value, present value formula kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So for those, instead of trying to recreate it, I just took a picture and just kind of plopped it in there. Yeah, but, yeah. If it's a complicated then, formula, it probably is easier just to throw in the picture. Um, but you can but do then, like fractions. You should be able to do inequality symbols and all in there. Okay, I have to look at it again. Okay, okay, that's good to know then. And then, like you said, with the um, that one where you can highlight, no, not highlight, um, the label and image. Just trying to think how I could use it. I like it, but I don't know how I use it. I could use it in my math. Mm -hmm. It might be good for like a graph, like if you're trying to have students identify, like uh, you know, identify like different parts of the graph depending on um, what you're doing. Um, if it's like a box plot, you can have them. You know, where is the median? Where is the is there an outlier or, you know, even, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. Um, find the y-intercept if it's a coordinate plane, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll play with it a little bit more. All right. Thank you very much. This was good. Yeah. I appreciate Thanks for joining it. joining us. Thank you. Let me get the link real quick before you go. Uh, yeah. Uh, here it is again, too. Thank you.